Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Future Drive podcast. Today, we're joined by Seb from Capital Dense. How are you today, Seb? Good, thanks, Jermaine. Uh, lovely day, so great to be on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So uh, let's start off with um, Capital Dense. What's, what's it all about? All right, so Capital Dense is a small business I run uh, by myself. Uh, specializes in PDR, which is the paintless dent removal of dents in cars. So I mainly focus on minor stuff, shopping trolley dings and hail damage. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so talk me back to, actually, let's start with how old you are now. So currently I'm 22. I'll be 23 um, in February. So mm-hmm. uh, quite young, but... Uh, so when did you start the, the process of, uh, did you start the business recently, I assume, or has it been yeah, going for a while? Relatively recently. So I started back in... December of 2016. So, mm-hmm. um, in December this year, it'll be two years. So, not okay. Long. And talk me um, about the, I guess, um, the backstory there. Were you always, you know, have, have has your dad been a mechanic, and you sort of mm-hmm. always are, are around cars, or um, did you sort of see an opportunity um, in a space that was fairly quiet, or how did you get into paintless dent removal? Because it's not necessarily a well-known sort of area. Um, so how did you stumble across it or did you very intentionally go in this direction? Yeah, look, it was a combination of all the things you've just brought up there. So um, it definitely started with my father. So my dad's always been in the car game around cars and I've sort of been brought up around cars and interested in cars. Um, when he was my age, he was originally a touch-up guy, which means he specialised in a lot of uh, paint repair and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. He's worked his way up through a range of businesses um, and to this day is still in the car industry. So um, I was sort of looking at getting out of the job I was in at the time, which was hospitality work. It was getting into long hours and um, late nights and I was sort of getting over the responsibility of having to manage a team that mm-hmm. if anything went wrong, it sort of fell back on me and I had no control over it. Um, so I was speaking to dad one night and he said, Seb, you know what you should get into? I think you should have a look at these guys that do painless dent removal. Mm-hmm. So I started researching because um, obviously when he was my age in the paint game, he always saw these dent guys coming to the car yards where he'd be working and they'd be doing the dents. Mm-hmm. He always thought it was much better than the paint because there's no materials. It's sort of just a skill-based trade. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I looked into the course. I had a bit of money saved up. Um, was looking into a few courses all around Australia. I ended up finding a training down in Ballarat. Mm-hmm. I'm in Victoria. Um, so I spoke to the guy down there. His name was Laurie. Um, he sort of talked me through the process and what it involves. Um, and yeah, that sort of sparked my interest from there. So I, I did a bit more work at the bar to save a bit more money up. And yeah, um, yeah I sort of jumped off the deep end, I guess. I didn't, I didn't really tell many of the mates or much of the family what I was doing. I sort of just carted my way down to Ballarat yeah. um, and did this course out of nowhere. All the, all the fellas at home were pretty shocked. But, um, yeah, <laughs> How long did the it. course go for? So it was a two-week two intensive course. Uh-huh. Um, and then all they teach you there is just the basics of the trade. Right. So, um, so sort of the fundamentals of it all. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And then what so, do you, what did you do from there? Like, I assume you can't just, you didn't do the two weeks and then just hop on and start doing client no, cars. No, that's right. It's not like money making like that. I actually came home. So in December, I worked through all of the summer holidays. I just had a bonnet set up at home. So I went, okay. and went to the scrap yards. I picked up a bonnet. I set it up at home and then I just put dints in it with the hammer and then practice pushing them up. So that was yeah. my whole summer holidays, which is practicing pushing up dents. Um, so I was doing that. So how old were you here? Like, um, so you're uh, 23 would, soon? Been, yeah, so I'm 23 soon. So it would have been like late 20s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Late, late 20, I think I was about to okay. be 21. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It, it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty full on. Um, I, it was really frustrating. Uh, it, it wasn't something that I picked up straight away. Um, mm-hmm. So it took a lot of time and effort just to get even the smallest dents out. So I worked on the bonnet, I worked on the bonnet and then I eventually started denting my own car because I thought I had a bit more <laughs> I wouldn't sit down and really focus on the dents. I right. started denting my own car and then working the dents out. 
So obviously I had, I had an incentive to work towards. It wasn't sort of just some scrap bonnet that I didn't really care much about. I sort of dented my own car. I was like, all right, this has to get fixed. Yeah. So I found that was probably the breaking point between sitting at home and doing work and then getting out there in the industry and actually finding paid work. Yeah. So two things come out for me. One is that, um, is that you followed somewhat natural, but somewhat sort of artificial route to get to where you were, um, which is, I find always interesting because I think a lot of people um, have a feeling that they've got to sort of, yeah, you've got to do something you love, but they think that that means that they've got to do something that sort of comes to them naturally that they've sort of, you know, that one day they're doing, doing an activity and they go, Oh, um, I really like this. Maybe I should make a business out of it. But it sounds to me more like you went, you know, there's this adjacent sort of area that I like, um, but then went through the logical process of going, let's see where there's a demand. Let's see what, what piques my interest. But it was a sort of a nice mix of natural sort of, um, leading in, but also artificially in the sense that you sort of looked at, looked at sort of the business case for it. Um, and then went down that route. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's very accurate. I, um, yeah, as I said, there, there wasn't many guys, even when I was looking into, it, I was doing a bit of research just to the, the market sharing camera of paintless den repair guys. And there really wasn't many, there was probably half a dozen mm-hmm. um, guys in Canberra with a population of, you know, 380,000. That's, that's not many when you mm-hmm. think about the volume of cars for all those people. So it's definitely a niche, but a niche, but there was a hole in the market because there, there isn't many of us getting around. So yeah, the stars sort of aligned and it, it, I've always been interested in tinkering. I've always been a tinkerer. I like playing around with things, taking apart things. Um, and I'm, I'm just a general interest in to like fixing things and seeing mm-hmm. how they work. Not so much from a uh, engineering point of view, but more of getting a hands-on like approach and actually doing it yourself. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. the second thing I noticed when we talk about it is I mean, the first time we met was because you actually came and worked on my car. Um, and what stood out to me then was the, the care and the sort of very intentional, um, effort that you put around it because it's easy to, um, think about, I mean, you mentioned it wasn't this sort of two week course and then start making money, start sort of printing money out, even though there's a market, there's there's this whole market to sort of tap into. Um, and it was evident that that's not what, you were after um, because you spent a lot of intentional care and effort to make sure that, you know, the solution wasn't just it's okay to the naked eye, but you use your tools to make sure that it's okay under any light. It's sort of back to factory good. Um, exactly right. And yeah. I assume you, and that's that shows because part of your training that you imposed upon yourself was to damage your own car to make sure that then you bring it back to factory conditions. Um, exactly right. If yeah. not better. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. A lot of, yeah. Do you find that a lot of people, like, do you find that your friends are surprised that you put in that much effort? Do you find that they, they're a bit surprised almost or, or do they sort of know you so they're okay with it? Um, what, what do you find? I think most of my friends group, we all, we all definitely work pretty hard. Um, mm-hmm. I've got a few mates that work for themselves doing various other things. So I'm definitely surrounded by people that like to like work, work hard and like reap the results of that that, that hard work mm-hmm. um i definitely shocked because i was pouring beers one minute and then the next i was sort of down in ballarat doing this course of some in this industry that no one had really heard of so that definitely shocked in that sense but i i, I think that um it, it was probably a good approach because i didn't want to blow it up into this big thing that i was going away to do this thing yes even at the time, as i was driving down there i was like geez like am i going to really make a name for myself doing this it's like it's just such a bizarre thing to get into straight out of hospitality so mm. yeah um, there wasn't this sort of you know you couldn't sort of you went in hospitality and then opening up your own cafe yeah. so at least there was this natural sort of progression this exactly was right. going from you know for, from a zig to a zag it was sort of the exactly. complete complete other yeah. spectrum and then yeah. it's an unheard of sort of art and unheard of sort of job. Um, yeah. And you mentioned sort of, you didn't want to blow it up and make it a big deal to start off with. Um, that that sort of makes me think about the business itself. Now you're, you're mobile, um, you, you have That's a mobile right. workshop essentially. Yeah, exactly right. And w- w- were you always going to do that or is that something normal in this space or were you looking at getting, getting a space? I guess what I'm trying to work out here is, um, yeah. I'm a big fan of starting off 
slowly. There's a lot of people yeah. who think you've got to go get loans, make a lot of money. Now that, that, that works in some industries. That's good for some people, but yeah. I think, you know, starting off slowly, building it up and, you know, um, even like we, in the last few months, we moved into an office and even sort of looking at that when we got equipment, I got equipment that was not cheap, but not, not high, super high end. Cause I sort of work by the logic that when that gets worn out, when that breaks, that means that we should be generating enough revenue using those tools to then go to something higher end. So did you take that approach of let's start off you know, baby steps or did you sort of go, dad, mom, can you, you know, give me some money. I'm going to get a lease. I'm going to get a big, big workshop. Yeah. How, how did you sort of approach that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Jermaine. I, um, I wanted to start off as small as possible with, with, and shrink those overheads down to as like the, the being a very number. small part. Yeah, exactly. Right. So obviously the money wasn't coming in as I explained earlier straight away. So my decision was to go mobile to find a lease, to find a workshop somewhere in Fishwick or somewhere in uh, somewhere in Mitchell, which is like the industrial areas of Canberra. I, I don't think that was a realistic goal for myself. First off, I didn't have the accounts to to make the work happen, so I could be paying off the weekly lease, and um, I, I just don't think I would have felt comfortable at my skill level to have a whole shop and have cars coming into me. I think I would have been pretty overloaded. Mm -hmm. So the the next best logical step was to go mobile. So in this industry, we're pretty lucky because my tools consist of probably, I don't know, there's two bags, two large bags of tools, which I can carry in my hands and that's mm -hmm. all I need to, to do a job. So I mean, mobile is a very, uh, very viable option. So I chose to go mobile, cutting all my tools in the, in the truck. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd drive around, I'd have a route. So it's called route work. So I uh, say on a Monday, I've got a, I've got a car yard in Belcon and I've got a car yard in Mitchell and then I've got a car yard in Fishwick. So I'd make a route mm -hmm. and I'd go around in that route um, throughout the day. And then being mobile just makes it that much easier because the car yards don't like to move their cars off the lot because obviously that's time that customers aren't seeing them face to face. Mm -hmm. So if we keep the car on the lot, do the job on the car, on the car yard, on the car in the car yard, then mm -hmm. it's pretty simple. Um, the car yard's happy. I'm happy because um, I'm not paying enormous overheads for some building that I'm not taking full use out of. But I mean, eventually down the line, I would like to look at having my own space. It's just for now, especially while I'm trying to break into that market. Um, I, I think building up those accounts and rapport with uh, business owners, it's just better to be mobile because then, you know, the onus is on you to make it there. And the liabilities are less as well. You're not moving cars around exactly. and you're not, yeah, no. you're working on a car, but you're not sort of taking ownership of it. It's still on someone else's property. And I would assume that makes it cheaper for any sort of insurances that you have to have as well. Um, exactly right. That now is a nice segue into, you talked about having car yards. Um, you obviously yeah. did some work on my car and that was as a, as just a individual, I guess, uh, not a business. So yeah. um, do you have a lot of business businesses that you work for with a lot of car yards um, or is it sort of 50, 50 and, and yeah. what's, what direction do you want to take it in moving forward? Sure. So I'd say the car yards are my bread and butter. So the, 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 that's where majority of my money is coming in from. And again, the, uh, the positives from the car yards are that they're giving me work every week. So mm -hmm. like yourself, obviously I'd hate to see a beautiful car dented every week, but the thing is with a private customer, I go to them, I service their car and I might not hear for them again for six months, a, a yes. year, sometimes longer, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the car yards, they're constantly cycling cars out. They're constantly getting dense. So it's just constant work. And that's the thing that's hard to find in this industry because no one wants dents in their cars. But obviously I need dents to make the business work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all, almost yeah. sort of like in the insurance game where you need something bad to happen to then get exactly. business. Um, exactly right. but you don't necessarily wish that upon anyone. Um, yeah. I love that yeah. when you send me the invoice, you sort of said, I hope you stay debt free, which is counterintuitive yeah. to you as a business, because That's realistically right. you've got to be thinking, I hope you get a bunch of small dents in the next you know, six months uh, and it really yeah. bugs yeah. you. Um, yeah. but I guess yeah. the benefit there though, is that once someone does get a dent, um, in a lot of cases, if, especially if they care about the vehicle, um, as a business would, um, that, 
there's a lot of incentive for them to pay for the service. It's not something that they can just ignore. Um, yeah. If you're a private individual, probably a different story, unless you know you're really proud of your car, I would, I would guess. Um, mm-hmm. But otherwise, um, if there's that, I guess, the, the bonus there that you're mobile and if a car comes in, you know, a used car and they were going to put it on the lot, it's very much in their interest to get that dead sorted. So they're going to pay, pay you for it. And, and I guess that's why you get the regular work there. Exactly right. Yeah. Now, how'd you work out pricing? Um, what, what, what approach did you take? Did you sort of go to them and um, did you get an understanding of what other people were charging first? Or because yeah. I assume for a business, you're almost at a wholesale rate, so to speak. And then for the private individuals, you go at a, at a sort of a retail rate. How did you get yeah. those numbers? What did you do? Okay, so we're going back to the training in Ballarat then and there was a whole portion of that training that did talk about pricing and how you price a job. Mm-hmm. So um, they, they give you a good idea of what you sort of should be charging and you want to be relating your price to what um, panel beaters would charge. So say you've got a 50 cent size piece dent in your door, a panel beater, that have to take the whole, whole door off, they would weld tabs on, pull the dent out, strip back the paint, repaint the door and then blend it all out. Mm-hmm. So you know, you'd be looking at, I don't know, well in excess of $500 for a job like that, a small dent on your door. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the benefits of paintless dent repair are that we aren't invading that factory finish on mm-hmm. your car. So you get to keep the original paint and um, work out the metal same day service. So th- there's a lot of benefits to having painless dent repair over traditional panel beating. So we've got to price our pricing sort of close to close to panel beating, but just under because at the end of the day, we want them to come to us over normal panel right. beating. Mm-hmm. So it, it is a tough line because sometimes you sort of got to price a job on how, how much time you're going to put into it. Yes. So, so if you think a job's going to take you an hour, then you've got to price accordingly. It's not necessarily where the job is or how big it is. It's just based off what you think your ability is mm-hmm. and how you can get the job done because everything's an hourly rate. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the best way to do it. Um, and so how did you, did you, when you approach the, um, I guess this is going to lead acquisition to, to your point as well. How did you get into these car yards? Um, in the first place, because I would assume that you said there's sort of a half a dozen in Canberra doing doing the work. I assume there's a lot more car yards, um, but you know, I, I would think that a lot of them, if it, if they spend one day at each car yard, most car yards would then be covered. Um, or is that not what you found? Did you find that there were still a few sort of car yards yeah. looking for individuals with your sort of expertise? Yeah, yeah. So of the half a dozen guys that do paintless dent repair in um, Canberra. There's probably only three that are mobile like myself. Mm-hmm. So um, of the three guys, I found the biggest thing when I was first coming out or hearing about the other guys um, was reliability. So that was, the, that was the biggest problem when they where the other guys seemed to be going wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, not everyone. Definitely there's some great guys in Canberra, but some of them just couldn't be there when they say they're going to be there. Other jobs would come up, they'd get too busy. So that's sort of where I seg- my, like segue myself into the market. My first car yard was in Belconnen, Belconnen Cheap Cars. So it's the sister um, business of Gerald Slavin in Belconnen mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And what I did was I said, look, I'd just love to work for free for for the first, what was it? I started in end of April. I probably worked there for four weeks just free, just doing mm-hmm. dance for free. So I was just doing dance, doing dance. And I noticed that when they called the other dent guy up, he would never show up. So I was sort of getting better at the work. I was still practicing at home at the time, doing my own car, doing the dents there. And then I finally felt confident enough where I could sit down with the manager and say, look, I think my work's definitely doing, um, definitely like meeting your standards. So mm. I'd love to, I, I'd appreciate it if I could start charging for the bills. I was sort of, I was a bit nervous because it was like my first job. I was jumping in the deep end. I was asking yeah. to get paid for work um, that I was doing, which was, pretty phenomenal for me because I was used to just getting a paycheck at the end of the week. So mm-hmm. I'm sort of telling him that I'd like to start getting paid and um, it all went well in the end. And um, that, that was sort of my first break into the market. So I was just working on small cars, 
not expensive cars or anything that like so fifteen to twenty thousand dollar cars, so pretty mm-hmm. cheap. Mm-hmm. And um, I was just doing dance every Friday there, so I still do okay. that every Friday actually. But um, so yeah, were you working a- part time um, while doing was- this? Yeah, that's right. So I've got I, to fund the- fund the sort of side hustle, I guess. Exactly right. So I, when I did the training, I took two weeks off from the hospitality job. So I was mm. at a pub um, in O'Connor. So I was managing there. I took two weeks off there. And then when I came back, I was still working the pub and I was doing the dance at night. So I was doing that all the way up until, I don't know, it must have been close to mid-year mm. the following year. So it was about June or July. So 2018 or 2017? 2017. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... 2017. Yeah, that's correct. Um, no, sorry, Jermaine. It's 2018. So it was 2018. last year. Yeah. I've only been doing it for two years. So it was last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had the pub job at the same time. And then I was doing the dance during the day. So I was pretty full on. Um, took a toll on the body because I'd be doing the late nights and then yeah. up early. But I mean, it was only a couple of months at the end of the day. And um, I just had to wait to set up a few accounts where I could balance my income from the pub. Of course, you you had to take sort of a responsible approach to it. You didn't want to sort of dump it and then live off your savings. Um, You wanted to transition it so that you weren't, yeah, sort of, because otherwise you get in a position where um, you'd have to charge next to nothing just because you need the cash flow. And and Mm. you obviously didn't want to, you you took a more considered, more logical, I would say, approach from a financial point of view um, before, before sort of, yeah, just jumping in blind. Um, I had a question that I was going to ask you, but it's not coming to me right now. Um, oh, the working for free. So that brings up yeah. a whole thing again. Um, I think we chatted about it when he actually came to work on my car. Um, was that, I mean, coming personally coming from sort of the marketing design sort of space, doing a bit of photography on the side as well. Um, my industry is an industry that's known for people, um, going on about, you know, um, come take photos or, come come do some you know design a logo for exposure um yeah which is free as far as i'm concerned most of these people they can't they don't care enough about the brand they don't they're not getting enough work to actually for that to lead to enough exposure you're not talking about you know nike saying do this work for free um yeah these are just people starting off so there's no exposure to even speak about and then you mentioned that you work for free for for four weeks um i'm sure people listen to it going you know these guys are the problem. This is why, you know, painless dent repairs. It's, you know, this, this sort of cheap art because people just think that they can get work for free. So there's no value to it. What do you say yeah. in response to that? Definitely. I can understand because it is a problem in, in the industry where guys are often undercutting each other and then it becomes, it actually, it takes a toll on the whole industry because if guys keep undercutting each other, it actually undercuts the whole industry and what we do. It's a race to the bottom. Like, Exactly right. So if, if we valued out what we did more more highly, then I guess it'd be better for everyone. And we sort of stuck together as a group, but everyone's competitive. So, you know, it, it's tough to sort of work as a team when you're all your own business. Mm-hmm. Um, look, I, I don't know. I, I found there was no other way for me to get out there. Like, because my skills weren't there. There's guys that have been in this industry for 20, 25 years. And I mean, mm. I was coming out after three months of training and I didn't have anywhere near the skill level that these guys had. So it's tough to sort of come out there and charge, you know, a premium price for a subpar, uh, subpar result. Yeah. So um, I, I found that making a sacrifice to the price was the only way that I could sort of show these guys what I was doing. And like you mentioned, it's, it's just about that exposure. And I really need to expose like myself and my brand and the business to like what I was doing and how good I was. I was trying to market the reliability because I noticed that was the biggest, the biggest gap. I'd be there. Even if there was no work, I'd be there at Friday at 9am. You know what I mean? So, you know, it, it was the only way I could sort of show what I was made of and what I wanted the business to be. Um, so I think that they started to pick pick me on and then they speak to other car yards and then it sort of just branched out from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was it is a shame that I had to undercut the price, but I mean when you when you don't have the skills to back it up, it's sort of the only place you can turn to. So Yeah. I, I mean I sort of led you into this question um yeah. almost intentionally just to see sort of what you 
how you felt about it. Um, but you know, personally, what I find, I, I still do pro bono work now, but that's for more for charities and things like that. Um, and right. I still do, uh, what's called time for print work, which is, uh, basically you, you line up a model, you do, do a photo shoot, um, and you agree that, you know, instead of compensating the model, um, and the model compensating you for your photography, it sort of evens out by saying, you know, you would have got paid X amount. I would have got paid X amount. Let's just say we paid each other. So zero it out. Um, but the reason I sort of want wanted to hear about it was because I think again free work is something that people like to really really I guess jump on and really talk down um yeah but ultimately I in my humble opinion you shouldn't be apologetic for that kind of thing because you realize that you needed the exposure you needed the experience you it's not that your work was valued at zero it's that they had to take on some level of risk that that it wouldn't make sense for them to compensate you for. So the way I see it, you're essentially zeroing it out because they have to take a risk that, you know, for all they know, you come in and make the dent worse or, you know, yeah. result in them I don't know, scratching exactly. the paint and having to respray exactly the whole right. door. Um, yeah. And you sort of recognize that and just realize that you had to put in the work to, to continue to get the work. Um, mm. And, and I love that because, that again just shows that you're hungry and you and you and you want to um, sort of uh, break into this space and show people that you know what you're doing versus expecting everyone to pay you straight off the bat. Um, yeah. And the second thing you mentioned was the reliability. I mean, uh, we we were booked for a Wednesday at nine thirty in the morning, and yeah. when I heard uh, someone open the door at nine twenty five, um, no offense to your industry, but I wasn't expecting it to be you. You know, yeah, um, yeah, it absolutely. just it just wasn't um and then it was you and i was like that's that's fantastic like he's actually turned up um actually earlier than he said he would um where normally i would have assumed if you said 9 30 you'd turn up hopefully before 11 (laughs) o'clock yeah and and no offense to his space but you you, as you've also worked out it's it is something that um all you got to do sometimes is obviously got to do good work but just turn up on time and you're already sort of a step ahead. Definitely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's something my dad taught me even going to my first job when I was first interviewing for the hospitality jobs. He's like, doesn't matter if they interview to get the jobs at 11, you've always got to be, you're better off to be 15 minutes early than one minute late. And it's always something I've carried through from from work to now starting my own business. Mm-hmm. And it's gone a long way because I'll get calls I might get a call tomorrow that there's an emergency dent at Honda. Mm -hmm. Um, The customer's coming at three o'clock to pick up the car. Can you be here at 12? And it's not a question of, yeah, I can get there by one. You have to be there on time because the job's not getting done otherwise. That's it. The car's not ready to pick up at three o'clock and that's bad on you. That's bad on them. And it's bad on everyone involved. Exactly right. So, you know, I think it's simple things that they go a long way and it just helps the business. So do you use um, any sort of intentional marketing methods to get clients at the moment? Or is it a lot of sort of doing the hard yards, getting, doing good work, and then that leading to word of mouth sort of jobs? Uh, definitely. The thing I found is that word of mouth is by far the best marketing tool I, I have currently. I'm not, I'm, I'm breaking out into the social media platforms, but I, I'm not huge on them quite yet. Um, again, I'm just trying to, get a good base on the uh, car yards around Canberra before I break out into the private market and retail market a bit more. Um, I think the marketing like on social platforms would definitely help with people like yourself and people Mm -hmm. who just have the one off door ding. But I mean, the car yards aren't scrolling through Instagram, looking at my work, you know, that they're sort of just hearing about someone. Is he good? Is he reliable? Yep. All right. Call him up. We need him here. Yeah. So, So there's sort of that offline networking element as well, I would guess of, you know, you turn up to the car yard, you talk to them, you shake hands with the GM or whoever's in charge of sort of working with you. And then, then if you want more work or if you start to start to grow and get say one other person on board, then it's a matter of sort of going, mate, you know, thanks for, for today. Um, just so you know, we're getting someone else on board. Um, yeah. so we're really looking to sort of increase volume. And if, mm-hmm. if you can sort of manage that, then you can just grow, uh, sort of through that offline networking sort of approach. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that's the best way to do it. And, um, 
yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing where we go in the next, yeah, sort of six in months. In the years to come, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. What are some mistakes that you've made um, through your journey? Any, anything that comes to your mind that goes, that you go, you know, uh, if someone else was to talk to me about whether it's this space or just business or life in general that yeah. you would sort of avoid? So to go to business directly, I'll say my biggest mistake and still I'm pr- probably guilty of this is underquoting my work. So um, it, it's bad because I don't know, I get some bigger jobs like a hail damaged car and I sort of quoted out, you count the dents out and you're not, you know, a car might have 300 dents on it and you're not obviously charging what you would for one door ding for 300 mm-hmm. dents because it'd be astronomical. So mm-hmm. well, I found it hard to sort of find the fine line between wanting, wanting to get the job, but also valuing your time and the effort you put into the work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a hail damage car is great for someone like me who's still new in the industry because it's heaps of work. It's heaps of practice. You get a lot of practice stripping out like the interior of the car it's just fantastic for someone like myself. So I really want the job, but at the same time, it's got to be worth it for me. I I can't under undercut my, you know, what I do just because I I want the job. So I I found it hard to, you know, find the sweet line between getting the price right and getting the job. Um, Mm. That's that's probably one of the, one one of the big mistakes I've made. Um, Another mistake I've made is I've had brand new cars. Um, brand new cars out of the lot and they've had dents and I managed to put a big scratch along the top of bonnets, you know, and, and that comes out of your own pocket at the end of the day. It's, yeah. it, it is the best way to learn, but it's a shame that it does happen like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was that a result of? Was it just, you know, accidental sort of being somewhat careless? Just, or? Just accidental. Yeah. Probably just being careless, not being something had slipped off and just run right down the bonnet. So mm. it is my fault at the end of the day, but you know, you got, you just got to take full responsibility and, um, you know, offer to just reimburse. Mm. Exactly mm. right. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it is your fault. And even though you knew that there's sort of no, no place for that when you are running your own business, you know, the mistake for it, it comes back fully on you. And that's sort of what I was looking for getting out of hospitality, not to have, you know, no control because the boss is there and you've got these employees here meant to be looking up that sort of everything does come back on you so it's it's often you know quite full on at times but i mean that's what i came into the business for was to mm-hmm. have full responsibility of what i do and you know you got to live with the, the consequences, consequences yeah yeah you do make and they're not major mistakes you know a bit of a paint scratch it is annoying but it is a mistake and on a brand new car, it's not really one you, you can it's afford. It's ideal. Yeah. 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 Now, what do, you, what do you hope to do moving forward? Give me an idea of sort of what are the next steps for Capital Dance um, yeah. over the next six to 12 months, any sort of, um, you know, things that you feel will hopefully sort of move the needle a bit more, get you, you know, trending yeah. positively in terms of work and, and finances, any, anything coming up? Definitely. So, um, I want to break into the hail chasing scene. So um, in Australia, we're pretty unlucky slash lucky because we do get a lot of hail storms. So it's mm-hmm. good for me, not so good for anyone that does live in these areas. Um, last November, I'm not sure if you remember, but Sydney got hit by a massive hail storm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been speaking to guys up in Sydney and they're still fixing cars from last November. Wow. So, so 12 like- months ago. 12 months ago and they're still going, still churning through these cars and we're coming into next hail season. So we're probably looking at another big hail storm for the Sydney area. Wow. Um, and that that's where the money is and that's where I want to be because that's just maximum time on metal and maximum mm. time to just get your skills better. So you're getting paid and it's just, it's long hours, it's hard work, but that, that that's where I want to be to really develop my skills and further what I'm doing. So probably... I'm going to work pretty hard for the next eight months just in Canberra, growing those clients, keep going. And mm. then I'll probably look at getting up to Sydney um, and chasing some hail. It's called hail chasing. So we go up, we go up with a team of guys and sort of there's a, you know, general manager and he sort of manages you guys and he'll speak to all the assessors from the insurance companies. He brings all right. the cars in and um, you just, you hammer through them. So just, yeah. it, it's, long, it's long hours and it's, it's hard work, but I think, that's what will bring my skill to the next level where I need it to be. So I can really be competitive in Canberra mm-hmm. uh, with most of the other guys. Yeah. Um, 
one last thing before we sort of um, start wrapping up and ask um, and go into the top 12 and things like that. Um, yeah. Now that's escaped me. Um, ah, yes. So where do you, do you draw a line at, you know, do, do you envision sort of working hard for the next X amount of years and then going to, then do you know, do you have a thing in your head of like, I only have to work hard for so long and then I can sort of cruise or, for you, is it more of a, you know, it's, it's okay that I'm going to have to work hard for, for, you know, till I retire or whatever it is, because that's part of what you do. So I guess what I'm asking is, is this sort of just investing into sort of raking in the dollars in the future and having a whole lot of time that, that, that you can sort of spend doing anything else? Or um, are you not thinking about business that way? Is it more of a, you know, it's a lifestyle. It's something that you're going to do um, because you're passionate about it. How, how do you think about that sort of thing? Yeah, I'd say it's definitely a mixture of the two because I do have other interests and other hobbies. And I know a lot of people say you should make, you know, your hobbies, your job. And that is true, but I don't think I could make my hobbies my job because I, I enjoy them because I, I only get so much time to do them. So, mm. you know, with the business... I, do, I, I really enjoy the industry and what I'm doing. So uh, obviously growing, like growing my income and growing my reach um, is definitely something I want to be doing. But um, yeah, moving forward into the future, I, I do want to be just seeing how much potential there is to make money. Um, and I'm not looking at retiring by 32, you know, and then living off the money I've made by the time I'm 32. I, I definitely want to work hard and, you know, I've been brought up in a family and dad's still working hard. Mum's, mm-hmm. you know, worked hard her whole life. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I, I want to get to a place where I can just make as much money as I can and then just sort of coast. Yeah, I want to want to have this as a job that, you know, it, it's something that's always there. It's reliable because people are always going to have dents in their cars. You know what I mean? How do you so, get that drive? Because you, you said, you know, 300 dents on a car. Um, mm. The first thing that came to my head is one dent sounds hard work. 300, mm. I'd rather do anything else. Um, yeah. How do you yeah. motivate yourself to do that? What, how do you stay focused? What, do, you, do you have any tricks that you use? Um, what, what, what's, what's driving you? Look, money definitely motivates me. I've got to be honest. Uh, you know, of course, I, I hey, that's not something yeah, to be ashamed yeah. about. I think it's. I think yeah, you're yeah. lying if you say that money isn't a motivation. Um, the yeah. people who can say money isn't a motivation are the people who have a lot of money and don't need to earn an income absolutely. to then continue to exist. But yeah, yeah, sorry, I cut you off. No, you're absolutely right. So when I'm there looking at 300 dents, you know, you just keep pushing. You sort of just stick your head down and just keep going. Yeah, it does get tough sometimes. And you get frustrated and. It's tough, you know, it's a quite a precise um, precise trade. So sometimes mm. your eyes get a bit blurry and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, I've got to think about, you know, with each dent, I'm getting better. And, you know, mm. it's better than sitting at home and, you know, doing anything else. So I, I just keep pushing, keep pushing and I get quicker. So that's part of getting better is getting quicker as well. So 300 dents might take me, you know, it probably took me a week. Mm when I did my first hail power and then there's guys in the industry that are doing 300 dents in a couple of hours. So you because you're just it, becoming better at the art. Exactly right. And that, I think that's what drives me because like the quicker I get at my work, obviously the quicker the money comes in too. So I've just got to think that with each dent, you know, yeah, you're just getting closer to sort of getting to that, you know, 300 dents in, in three hours instead exactly. of three days sort of mentality. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, I guess, just getting better. That's driving you is is sort of really honing in on what you're doing and sort of getting better in that space. Is that fair to say? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, before we get into the top 12, where can people find you? What, what, what now, you know, um, I guess we didn't really touch on what paintless dent repair is, but as the name suggests, essentially what you do is either go in from the inside of the car and push out the dents that it, it goes back to factory, or if you can't, go in and push out you sort of use some special glue to then pull out a dent is that that's right. correct yeah that's yeah that's correct we briefly touched on it before when i was talking about the panel shops yes but um yeah it, it is just the process of manipulating metal back to its factory condition and, and and you're not affecting the factory finish which is the most important part of keeping your cars um keeping your cars value is the original paint is the so, paint and the integrity of the paint 
exactly right because at the end of the day panel shops you can have the best you know best spray painting in australia to paint your um whole car, paint your car by hand but yeah. you know when you think of a big manufacturer like bmw they've got multi-million dollar robots that are mm. spray painting cars with yeah. their metal it's hard to replicate a factory finish well, i would say it's it. near impossible um it, because it, they yeah, i mean right. don't they do yeah. things like they essentially have massive car sized ovens that bake the paint and yeah. then they spray okay. another layer on and it, it's this kind of stuff that you can't you can't do unless you strip the whole car back to bare metal, which right. no one's going to do to repaint a car. You're not going to get rid of yeah. the engine and all the internals that, just to right. do it. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess it paintless dent re removal works best where dents have been caused that haven't gotten rid of the paint. Um, is that That's fair to say as well? Yeah. Yeah. Paintless dent removal. So when the paint's been cracked, of, of, it can sometimes uh, ruin the integrity of the, the surrounding paint. Mm -hmm. So um, I, ideally, we don't want to be dealing with paint, uh, damaged paints. But then again, I know some guys in Canberra, they work directly with panel shops. So if paint has been damaged, mm -hmm. they, they massage the metal out to get it flat. And then the panel shop will paint it because it beats them having to order a new door skin mm -hmm. only to put it on the car. So, you know, we sort of work hand in hand with panel shops at the same time because if yeah. it is just a small 50 cent size dent, then... They'll, you might as well massage it out. Going in, they'll work it out and then they'll repaint it opposed to ordering a new door from the factory and then mm -hmm. having to, And waiting know, for then the costs and all that involved as well. Right. And, and again, I would assume if, because when you get a new door, you can't necessarily put the interior finishing back to the same mm -hmm. quality and the same standards. Um, so you might as well avoid all that and not touch any of that really yeah. and get in yeah. underneath and um massage it out so no sounds good um so where can people find you do you have a website do you have socials yeah. so, no website at the moment i think i might be speaking to someone about that soon but um, <laughs> yeah i'm just on instagram currently i've just started up on instagram at capital dents uh, pretty mm -hmm. simple um and then yeah any email inquiries or anything like that can be sent through there um but again in these early stages i'm just working off word of mouth and trying to get that good good base before I sort of pump a lot of money into marketing yeah. at the moment money is just going back into buying tools and back into the business. Mm -hmm. So I know marketing is going back into the business, but you know, I sort of need to get that good base um, with the car yards mm -hmm. and then hopefully, yeah, by the next six to 12 months, I'll definitely be looking at getting a website, even uploading to YouTube. I'm a big fan of YouTube um, and there is a few PDR guys on YouTube have really grown their channel quite quickly mm -hmm. in the last sort of 12 months. Um, I'm sure you know the platform's massive yeah. um, and it sort of gives people a sense for what you actually do because people don't, sort of hear about it, but they don't know. So if I can do a video and show them, you know, link it in my bio and in Instagram and say, look, check out the link. This is what I do. And people are seeing, they're like, wow, that, that's pretty amazing. So I think it's more of an interactive way and you sort of, are giving interest to the customer as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know I've always enjoyed watching tutorials and how stuff works. And I think that, you know, a lot of people can say the same thing. So breaking into that uh, YouTube platform would definitely be something I'd be looking at as well. So yeah. keep your eyes out yeah. there. Awesome. Honest, awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll have the links to uh, your Instagram um, yeah. in the show notes. So anyone listening, anyone watching the video, um, it'll be yeah. there and you can get in touch with Seb if you have any um any paintless dent removal needs. Um, let's get on to the top 12. You ready? Fantastic. Let's yeah. Go. All right. So uh, top three books or podcasts that you recommend to anyone listening. Okay. So unfortunately I'm not much of a reader. My uh, girlfriend would hate to hear me saying that. She's always trying to get me to read more, but <laughs> I, I do listen to a lot of podcasts being, being that I work alone. Um, often like in sheds, like by myself, I listen to a lot of podcasts. So I turn through a lot of, audio time i should probably get into some audio books as well mm -hmm. but um podcasts i've found five minute marketing is just something that uh, I, I don't know it, it, it's unparalleled they're just short little snippets they give you some great great information on how to like uh how, how to market your business, yourself as yeah. a brand yeah and, mm -hmm. and your skills so i found they're really great um and then i listen to a lot of joe rogan mm -hmm. i listen to a lot of like stuff that's not directly um, related to business, but about how people work and their behavior 
and what they're more inclined to do. I, I listen to a lot of guests, but I, I find a lot of interest in the entrepreneurs that he gets on the show and he mm -hmm. talks to. They're obviously me me mega successful. He's had guys like Elon Musk and, mm -hmm. you know, you know mega massive names on yeah. The show. yeah massive names but even the smaller guys or even the hard working guys he's had plenty of marines on it and just that fact fact of like you know it is all in your mind and you know if you can put mm. your mind to something that it, it, you reap the rewards so yeah and there's a I'm third one it. a third one i don't know i'd probably put it down to those two um, yep no yeah, sounds good those two uh, yeah i've um I need to get into some more reading. So um, Audible is fantastic. I, Audible, yeah, I yeah. personally vouch for Audible. There's a few audio books on there that I would, I would recommend. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah I'm right. listening to one at the moment uh, by Pat Flynn um, okay. called super fans. Um, okay. It's about Pat Flynn's got a, got a podcast called smart passive income um, mm -hmm. and ask Pat 2.0. So podcast that I'd recommend you check out as well um, yeah. where he gets people yeah. on talks about marketing um, and yeah. super fans is all about um, building out, not just fans, but super fans for your business. Um, okay. who, talking about word of mouth, this is essentially how to sort of grow that in a very organic but intentional way. So, um, yeah, really recommend you check that out. Um, yeah. I was waiting for his audio book. He released a book a few months ago and finally the audio books out. So I've been listening to it every single uh, minute that I listen to a pod, listen to any sort of audio moving on top three software tools that you can't live without anything, any sort of tech tech tools, anything technology wise that you use every day. Yeah. So I use, I use a platform for my invoicing called the invoicing to go. Um, mm -hmm. it's pretty simple subscription based, uh, app and it's on uh got a website as well and i find it's just seamless the connection between your phone and the website is awesome i can be on the car yard write up a quote or write up an invoice like on the spot um and then it's it sends through my um outlook inbox um directly to the customer it keeps a great log of paid invoices it even shows you when the customers open the invoice so you know they've received it mm -hmm. um it, so that's look, invoice to go or invoicing to go? Invoice to go, invoice, invoice to, to go. Number to go. Mm -hmm. um, it's been great. I've heard a lot of good things about uh, Zero as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably something I look at into, I look into when I grow the business a bit more, um, because then you know, as you get, uh, your accountant can then log in with you and sort of look at where. Yeah, you're your at. needs sort of increase, but that's while right, you're doing exactly. sort of starting off, you might as well start off with something a bit more affordable. Um, and simpler because yeah. you don't yeah. need anything too complex at the start. Definitely. So that, that'd be number one. Um, then number two would have to be Instagram. Instagram has been phenomenal in terms of connecting with clients, one like yourself, but mm. also other PDR guys. So PDR, the industry, it's massive in America, especially on the West Coast, California, San Diego area. And the best way to connect with these guys and talk to them about, you know, the industry, what they're doing, the tools they're using is through Instagram. It's fantastic with the voice memos. I've talked to, you know, dozens of guys, you know, you just send a question, just film it quickly and it zips across and it's just seamless, you know. Mm -hmm. You can interact with that, see the work they're doing. You can comment, you can ask how they're doing it. Uh, it's, it's been a huge help to, yeah, what, what I've been doing. So it's fantastic. Instagram, fantastic. Is there a third one? Uh, a third one, does it have to directly relate to marketing or what? My no, no, is? anything that you use yeah. that you yeah. that you would recommend someone else in the industry or just anyone else. Anything, in anything, anyone. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I'm subscribed to this uh, website. It's called denttrainer.com. So if any of you guys are ever looking at getting in the industry, I know it's a bit mm -hmm. of a niche, but denttrainer.com has been an absolute lifesaver in terms of teaching me things that I otherwise would have no idea about. So again, it's just got hundreds of, it's like a YouTube, it's like its own YouTube. You have to subscribe and get a subscription and log in. You log in, there's thousands of hours of video mm -hmm. and it's just been, yeah, tremendous in teaching me like various things about how to pull mini lights out from how to you know get beneath wheel wells of an m3 it's just that they've got hundreds of tips so it, it, they've been a great help trainer.com trainer .com. .com. awesome yeah. and one other tool that you use what do you use to listen to podcasts uh i use podcast app on iphone okay yep if, yeah if it yeah. works so pretty fantastic it, it shows me everything occasionally i use spotify mm -hmm. uh, for stuff 
that isn't on the podcast app, but I find that everything I'm interested in, it's there. I get a notification in the morning. I download it before I go to work and then, you know. Got it to listen to all day. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, top three mantras you try and live by anything sort of that you, that you yeah. keep in the back of your head when you need to be motivated or inspired. Yeah. So again, I touched on a few of them during the podcast, but dad's always told me that you know if you put your mind to something and you really believe it doesn't matter what it is you, you'll either go mad or it'll, it'll happen for you you know uh-huh. it's one of the two things you know probably three things you'll either die you'll go mad <laughs> or it's gonna happen, or it'll you know? happen. You'll, put a, you'll put 100 percent of your work into it um and, and it will happen it's just you know it's, it's, some things come easier to some people and some people have to put more work in but at the end of the day if you're willing to put the work in I think you'll always reap the rewards. It's not much of a mantra, but it, it, it's something I try to live by and, you know, work with in the back of my mind. So that'd mm-hmm. be one. Um, the second one is I, I find that just the whole sense of karma, like putting good things out into the universe, they always come back to you. I think you might do one thing one day to, you know, reap immediate rewards, but it, it probably won't help you down the line. I think you've got to be thinking about the bigger picture. You might do some free work, for, free dent for someone, a free marketing for someone here, you know, and you don't see immediate results. But I think that, that sort of stuff always comes back to you further down the line. You, mm-hmm. um, you know, karma, it's it's a big thing, I think. I think you put good energy out there and it, it always finds its way back, back to you. you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, again, just probably two for that one. Um, That's all right. But, yeah, yeah. That, that's all good. Um, top three people that you follow now. When I say follow, I mean you know top three people that um, you keep up to date with, you study, you um, yeah. not necessarily you know follow on Instagram or Twitter, but more um, people that you look up to or people that um, we can learn from and you learn from. Yeah. Um, probably personally in my own life, again, Dad. He's just always been pretty work hard work i've ever had any questions to do with business and how i deal with a customer or a client Mm -hmm. he's just been first hand there to help me so he's always probably first call point of action if i ever need you know any any questions answered but um again moving away from that um i love the way that joe rogan lives his life and he's managed to find a good balance between business and pleasure Mm-hmm. Um, he's got a, he got a lot of interest in line with myself in nature and um, martial arts and interest in all that sort of stuff. And I, I just love how he's become so mega successful, but managed to keep, you know, it, it's not all about money. He's, you know, obviously making a lot of money, but he's still super happy with what he's doing and who he is as a person. So mm-hmm. it's something that I want to be able to look back when I'm 40, 50 years old and be like, look, I haven't become this guy is completely obsessed with money we all love money you know it runs the world but you know i still want to have my interests and There's be able to do what he's just done money. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. right so yeah he's definitely someone that uh, i don't know not necessarily look up to but definitely hold up there as where i want to be at the end you know when, when i'm as a point of retire. reference and someone to exactly sort of exactly right look yeah, at. yeah 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 because you know i've just got di- we, we can't be exactly alike. He's not my idol or anything like that, but it, it's just cool to see someone that lives their life and is happy doing what they're doing. They're not sort of stuck down in some dead end job because the money's mm-hmm. kept in there. He's just happy doing what he's doing. Mm-hmm. So that, that's probably another one. And then uh, a third one would have to be Andrew, Andrew Uckel. So he's this dude... Um, he's a bit of a nature dude in Australia. He's based like he's a Steve Owen, like a young okay. Steve Owen. Yep. So he's based out um, up in the uh, Queensland at the moment. He does lots, lots of nature stuff. And I've always been involved with nature and like an interest in the wildlife. So I think those three people, so, like having someone business minded, but also, you know, someone who's surrounded by nature constantly. Um, it's good to have that balance because I could, name off three business people but you know my my interests aren't all in business so mm. i think you know to keep myself well around it i've always had interests in this guy andrew andrew Uckles. again he just does some amazing stuff for wildlife around the country and educating people on the dangerous animals we have here so yeah he, he's someone that comes to mind when I, I think three people that have been impactful because i do get stuck down with work a lot but it's good to have that escape 
from work and just totally switch off and relax and you know look look into another part or interest in my life i think it's yeah. it's a good thing because you can get totally obsessed with work and it works for a lot of people but i, I think to keep myself well rounded i've got to be able to switch off and then and unwind and sort of that I look, yeah that yeah I look have something to. more than just work and business and money that's right because yeah. i feel almost that the next day when i do go to work it's 100 percent work i'm not sort of my mind's not scattering anywhere else because I've had time to do that. So now yes. it's just work time. Yeah. So uh, having someone like Andrew Eucles, yeah, it, it's been awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, um, thanks for hopping on the Future Trap podcast. Um, yeah. Seb from Capital Dense. So we'll obviously um, have everything in the description below um, if you're listening to this or if you're watching, watching the uh, conversation on YouTube. Um, thanks for joining us, Seb. Thanks, Jermaine. Enjoyed it.